all of you. And uh, before we proceed further, a very quick introduction. My name is Vishal. I'm one of the founders of this organization called Think Tank. I also have my colleague, uh, Rajesh, who heads the competency-based education team in Think Tank. And uh, I have personally interacted with uh, many of you during the alternate lab sessions which CBSC had organized. But it's likely that you attended the session which was hosted by Dr. Prachita. A quick uh, introduction. So Think Tank has been working in the space of uh, education, specifically experiential science uh, for children from grade one to 10. We have been doing this work for the last seven years, uh, including the work by this, uh, our sister concerned Innovation and Science Promotion Foundation. <clears throat> We are based out of Bangalore. Uh, in fact, our office happens to be in Sir C. V. Raman's home. Uh, we are privileged to be associated with the Raman Research Institute Trust. And in fact, as many of you may already know, we also host this national level science competition called the Raman Awards. Uh, the finals happen right there in Sir C. V. Raman's home, where 100 selected children from all over India they come and participate for the event. It's a free competition. If you haven't had your school or your school children participate in it yet, please go ahead and recommend this to them. The details are there on the website, ramanaward.org. As I said, we are based out of Bangalore, lucky to be in this beautiful city. It of course has an amazing climate, but uh, which could be because of its geographic location, it's also one of the cities which has lots of trees and uh, it's one thing to see plants and another thing to see trees and we are seeing trees it means someone worked on it 50 years back and there is this gentleman called uh, sg neginal who worked for the karnataka forest department for almost 40 years and he's alone he's credited with this uh, plantation of around one and a half uh, million trees in Bangalore. So Bangalore was green. It had few botanical gardens, but uh, especially the trees and a variety of trees, which are right in the middle of the city, they came into existence because somebody had that vision. And it amazes me that when you plan something so much in advance, the real effect is visible after such a long time. To some extent, the education system that we all are uh, witnessing, most of us have been a product of the same system. That's around 200 or 250 years old. And many of us feel that there are some changes and some fundamental changes required in the system. And similar to the question of plantation of trees, we need to work on it now for something to be visible a few years down the line. Fortunately, in India, those changes have started happening and real fundamental changes have started happening. Many seeds are being sown now and we will see the effect of that. And the effect will be, trust me, it's the entire landscape of the Indian education system is going to change and it's going to change in, in a way that if we talk about it, if we look back and explain, this is how it used to happen, many people may be surprised. One such fundamental change is the whole system of competency-based education, and that's what today's workshop is about. <clears throat> the main agenda would be to give a very quick introduction, uh, because uh, in such a large group, I don't think more than one, one and a half hour, we will be able to uh, keep ourselves focused. But in that short duration, we will give an introduction to the uh, some work which we have done and uh, we are doing this work and um, we are working closely with the CBSC team so that we continue to get feedback if we are aligned with the vision. And in fact, one uh, review committee has also been framed by, the CB by CBSC and the review committee is going to review these CB content and then approve 
after which it will finally be available in the public domain for anyone to access. Okay, so let us get started with the session. I am going to take help from some of the slides because it uh, makes it easier to communicate. And uh, we will start with one simple question, especially for those of you who are from the science background. Here is the question. Uh, in the digestive system, we uh, eat a variety of food components. Starch is one of them. And starch gets broken down into the smaller molecules from where we can produce energy out of it. So which enzymes? I want you to name the enzyme and you can type in the chat window, name the enzyme which speeds up the process of breaking starch to sugar. Yes, Bindu ma'am and Lavanya ma'am. Yes, uh, I see many other responses as well. And it's interesting that some of you are saying salivary amylase, some are saying amylase itself. Somebody said lipase and, okay. So that's interesting. I see some other enzyme names as well. So here is the other question. Which part of the body secretes this enzyme? Or you may also, if you know, about more than one body parts, more than one organ, so you can write the names of those as well. Mouth, yes, Nisha ma'am is saying mouth. Uh, yeah. Pancreas, Lavanya ma'am is saying salivary gland and pancreas. Yes, Nisha ma'am has also said, sorry, I'm reading it from a distance and I am realizing that uh, my eyes are as old as my rest of the body. So yes, pancreas and salivary gland. So that's true. So uh, this was a very quick question. Now the same topic, I'm going to ask a very different question and we'll come back. The intent behind asking the question is not the question itself, but the effect of different types of question. So here is another question on the same topic, but a slightly different one. This is one of the famous experiments conducted by this gentleman called Ivan Pavlov. Uh, he was, of course, researching how digestion happens and uh, the role of saliva, etc. But uh, for whatever reasons, he's known more in the space of psychology. But uh, this is how the experiment goes, that a dog was put through four different situations and in that sequence, and in each case, so if you search for videos on YouTube, somebody has taken the effort and put those videos where Pavlov himself is seen and the dog is seen with the, a tube kind of thing uh, installed next to its mouth where the saliva gets collected. So it was made to go through four different stages. In the first stage, food was placed in front of the dog. Second, bell. Third is bell and food. And fourth was only bell. And I have a question for you in the poll window this time. So please respond on poll and not on chat. Let me take you through the question. So given that mouth secretes saliva for a purpose, in which of the four situations is the intended purpose not met? So I already have the votes of 20% uh, of you. We usually follow a thumb rule of waiting till we have 40% votes. And as many of you may already know, that these are anonymous polls. So no one is going to find out who has given what answer. So without any concerns or fear of, you can share your vote. Okay, let me end the poll and share the results. So that's interesting. We don't have a, a very clear majority. So yes, uh, technically majority votes have gone to situation four. So 19 out of the 46 people who voted have said in the fourth situation, the saliva was not, should not have been secreted. Four out of 46 have said situation three, 
many people have voted for situation two and five have voted for situation one as well let's look at the answer so first of all uh, i'm not sure if the question was unclear but as you can see in situation two there is no saliva secreted in all the other three situations you can see from the picture that some saliva is getting secreted so clearly situation two is not the right answer situation one yes the body was preparing itself to digest the food which it's seeing it happens with us as well we say that that was a mouth watering dish we get the aroma of some uh, food items the dishes and uh, through that itself the body starts saying hey you are going to get one of your favorite foods so uh, be prepared be ready the saliva helps in two ways one is of course the starch digestion that we talked about but it also has significant amount of water content which helps in mixing the food and making it fluid enough so that it can pass through the narrow canals of the digestive tract so situation 3 of course it should have been secreted because food was there situation 4 there was no food but the bell that confused the dog and that's why situation 4 the intended purpose of saliva was not met okay so why are we asking these questions it's the same topic but two different kinds of question and i want to draw your attention to the effect of asking a certain type of question if you look back at the previous uh, slide we had asked to name the enzyme so let's say i know which enzyme it is i know the name or maybe i don't know so it can be only these two situations can there be something in between that okay i know but i still have to use that to do something i know the name but can i use the understanding of that to apply it to solve some problem to answer a question <clears throat> in the second case it's not just about knowing that uh, what is the role of saliva but i also have to use my ability to interpret this picture and figure out what is happening here and based on that arrive at the correct answer <clears throat> okay so let's uh, zoom out and ask some very fundamental question and the reason we are zooming out is we want to now look at the relation between learning and assessment and we want to generalize it so the question i have for you you can respond on the chat window imagine you are well prepared for a test for an assessment and that that assessment need not be just written exam it could be that you are going to give a speech on the stage or it could be a a, <clears throat> a maybe a wedding party uh, so any kind of assessment so if you have learned well if you are well prepared do you think it will sh show up in the way you perform in the assessment is there a correlation between the quality and level the extent of your learning and your performance in the assessment and i uh, let me give you three options that's the beauty of multiple choice question this time when i posed the question i said uh, more of a yes no what if i say that yes always sometimes and never if i give you these three options then which one will you pick always okay there you go shweta ma'am has started that she said sometime indra ma'am is also saying that yeah thank you thank you so much for the quick responses it's so nice to see these uh, responses coming out it helps us stay connected in spite of being uh, on the virtual platform So unlike the previous question here we don't have one right answer uh, and as most of you are uh, thinking it sometimes happens that we are well prepared everything is ready but for whatever reason the performance is not so great in the test uh, whereas sometimes we are we haven't prepared as much for the assessment but we still score good marks or we perform very well so yes um, <clears throat> but there is a correlation 
now let's look at it from the other angle imagine you are preparing for a test and uh, assume this time that it's a written test and you also have the question papers of the last 10 years so you know what kind of assessment happens in that case will your uh, will your knowledge about the type of assessment have an impact on what you learn how you learn And again, the three options are yes, always, sometimes, and never. Maybe, okay. Somebody just said maybe. Lavanya ma'am is saying yes, yes, it has an effect. Shivali ji is also saying that yes, always. And Padmashri is saying sometimes. I'm sorry if I'm uh, not calling you by your correct name. I'm reading whatever is there. Uh, so. Please rename yourself if the device name or some other name is showing up. Yes, Shweta ma'am and uh, Indumati ma'am are also saying sometimes. So yes, <clears throat> it's uh, <clears throat> if I if I know that I'm going to be tested on this chapter. In fact, I remember my childhood days. It was very common that we would somehow go and ask the teacher, sir, please uh, take the important questions from the textbook because most of the times especially in the younger grades they would ask questions from the end of the chapter uh, exercise so they would tick and we would give more emphasis so we'll prepare everything and then give more importance to those selected questions so depending on what we are assessed on and if you in fact generalize this and come out of the school and the exam or test scenario even in life imagine going to a place where it so happens that the people there judge you based on how simply dressed you are. So more simple you are, more people will be impressed with you. So now you'll learn that and you'll try to adjust that. How can I go with a, a, a kurta pajama and maybe a, a sling bag and how can I look simpler and simpler? But imagine going to a party where everyone is dressed in uh, Western dresses or even if they are Indian dresses, silk sarees and say a wedding party. So now you are being judged and assessed in a different manner. So you learn differently, you'll prepare differently. So if assessment and learning, they are so closely correlated. And now uh, I'm making a statement that we prioritize to learn based on what we are assessed on. And hence learning and assessment, they both are interconnected. So we know, and in fact, that's the reason we conduct assessment because we want to find out how much people have learned. But the reverse is equally true. That the assessment also has a serious impact on learning. If that is the case, can we be more mindful about what we assess? And here is my question to you, which you may respond on the chat window, but I know most of you will opt for one of the three options. So given a choice, what would you like to assess? Knowledge or information or what was used, the competency, the ability which was used to gain that knowledge, gain that information, or would you like to test both of them? Let me um, still see the response. Okay, so there are some people who are opting for two as well. That was interesting. Ritu ma'am, Ritu ma'am is saying, I don't care for the knowledge part. If you have the ability, you'll get it. Many of you have opted for three. And uh, okay, Jyoti ma'am is also saying too. Oh, that's uh, interesting. M many of you are opting for the second option. And <clears throat> again, like the previous question, uh, the we don't have one right answer. The intent is more to uh, pay attention to the fact that the ability to gain knowledge is equally important. And it's interesting that whenever I've had this discussion with anyone, especially in the education space, they would say that, no, it's important to test the ability. But if you go back and do a very simple exercise, okay, just pick any two chapters from the textbook that you use for teaching in your classroom, look at the end of chapter questions, tick mark those which test only knowledge, like the first question that we started with. So either I know that it's called MILAs and that it's secreted by salivary glands and pancreas, or I don't know about it. So where only plain, just this is test, getting tested. 
just tick mark those type of questions and tick, identify the, the percentage of questions which test the ability and <clears throat> that that itself tells us that though in principle we feel that we should be testing the ability in practice the entire system is geared towards so in fact when we sit and try designing questions which test competencies it's really tough because we all being part of this system we have got programmed in certain way it's so common for us to start finding out if you know the name of something if you uh, and that to the concept so whether the child understands centrifugal force or not if the child throws that term everyone claps we are all very happy about it <clears throat> and that's a very silent programming which has happened and if we really want to shift towards competency based education then this needs to be broken that's the main intent i had behind asking these series of questions what's very interesting is when we talk about competency based education it's assessment which it more or less starts with assessment and ends at assessment what do i mean by that unlike other things if i test someone on a competency in a way that i make that person exercise the competency then i am also helping that person develop the competency it's same as let's say you are being tested on your ability to lift 5 kg weight and the test is as simple as you go and lift the weight so let's say you go you can't lift what do you do now you come back after a month be prepared and appear for the test again what's interesting is each time i attempt to lift that weight i'm building the muscles so one of course i'll in between i'll exercise and build my muscles stronger but let's say i take an year but in that entire year i have tried lifting that 5 kg weight 12 times so even if someone does not do anything else in between 12 times i have tried lifting the 5 kg weight and in the process i would have developed those muscles and hence when we talk about competency development quite a lot of it is about competency assessment so what are the competencies and can we have a look at some examples but before we switch and actually jump into the actual questions uh, let me see if i have missed anything interesting in the chat window yes shweta ma'am that's amazing assessment of learning say assessment for learning and assessment itself as learning thank you so much for stating that and assessment as learning is another very interesting term that you have uh, shared with us so we are going to now take some examples and um, in all these examples i want you to respond on the poll or chat window so that we can uh, experience and after that discuss about the types of competencies so here is the first question where the situation goes like this so as uh, some of you may know we have two types of plants uh, and the flower assume that it's the sexual reproduction that we are talking about then there is a bisexual flower which has male as well as female reproductive parts unisexual flower has either the male or the female part now if i show you the diagram or i give the flowers in your hand by looking at it can you determine which one is unisexual flower and which one is bisexual that is the question and here i have given a table of some of the daily life or the plants that we know of and categorize them uh, as unisexual or bisexual and the question is here is um, here are three figures three diagrams very simple hand drawn diagrams uh, and some of them have male parts some have female parts some have both what you are supposed to do is on the poll window answer this question that which out of the three figures is representing the papaya and brinjal flower brinjal uh, flowers and you have to respond in the order of brinjal flower uh, first and then papaya
I have the response from around 30% of you. We'll wait for a few more seconds. Okay, let's end the poll and see the results. <clears throat> Why do we stop at 40%? Because we always have some who choose to have nota. Uh, and 40% is good enough for us to see where the group stands. And it's interesting that we don't have a, uh, compared, compared to previous question, the fourth option here seems to have got maximum votes, but we also have some people, around 14 out of 53 have said A comma C. Uh, six have said C comma C and 11 have said A comma B. So let's look at the un right answer. And in this case, we do have one correct answer. I forgot to bring the table here. If you had it in front of you, it would have been easier. You didn't have to remember. Okay, so <clears throat> let's understand by looking at the shape of the reproductive parts, can I make out which one is male reproductive part and which one is female reproductive part? If I'm able to do that, that is the first step. So there is a concept recall, which I have to do. I have to recall what does a male reproductive part look like in a flower. And if that is clear, you can make out that this is the red uh, thing. That is the male reproductive part. And this is the female reproductive part. So very clearly C is uh, representing a bisexual flower, both A and B are unisexual flower. They are representing unisexual flower. Now, if we look at the table, the data says that papaya is unisexual and brinjal is bisexual. So the first option is very clearly C. So you can't have a comma C as the correct answer. You can't have A comma B as the correct answer because brinjal is represented only by C. Now between these two, which is the correct answer? So we know that papaya is unisexual by looking at this table. In that case, it has to be A or B. Since we have not been given the option C comma A, we'll have to go with C comma B. So the correct answer is the last option, which is C comma B. Uh, why this kind of title for this slide? Botanical sexism. It has a, an interesting story. So way back in 1949, the uh, guideline published by the Agriculture Department in USA, especially the California region, was that the citizens must follow uh, one guideline that if they are planting a tree, they should prefer to plant a male tree. That would help us avoid the nuisance of seeds as well as uh, uh, fruits. And uh, so you don't have to put a lot of effort in cleaning the trees. 50, 60 years down the line, uh, there's this gentleman uh, called Thomas. I'm not sure if I am pronouncing his name correctly and hence I want to go back and refer my notes. So his name was Thomas Ogren. He, uh, studied this deeper and came back with an analysis that because of this bias, this preference for male plants, we have a disproportionate number of pollens in the air. And that's also the reason we have uh, allergies so prevalent in our area. And this person has, if you search for his name, um, you'll be able to find it. And he's the one who coined this term botanical sexism. <clears throat> now let's switch the topic and come to one maths question. It's interesting that these four wheelers that we uh, use so often these days, it's so uncommon to see four wheelers which have wheels of different size. One four wheeler which gets used in practice is tractor which has the front wheel and rear wheel of different sizes. So the situation given to us is we have a tractor where the rear wheel has a diameter of 49 inches, front wheel has diameter of 28 inches. 
interestingly the rear wheel is so big that majority of mass is towards the back which also helps it in balancing plus the driver positioned at such a high position is able to very clearly see because when it gets used in the fields it helps the driver to see uh, what's happening so if the front wheel is lower uh, his visibility is blocked to the minimum so for both of these two reasons we have this kind of design but now let's look at it from a slightly different point of view so let's say the tractor is stationary then the front wheel there's one point on the wheel which is touching the road let's name that point as a the rear wheel point which is touching the road let's name it as b and the question i have for you is after how many rotations of the rear wheel and front wheel will both these two points touch the road again at the same time and you have to respond to this on the chat window uh, write it separately for both rear wheel and front wheel you may write it in the order of rear wheel first comma front wheel so if you write just two numbers that would also be fine you will have to do some calculations for this so it's okay for you to take uh, time use notebook and pen if required and then come back with the answer okay we have one response and the first two responses are very different shivali ji is saying 1,1 padmini ji is saying 4,7 please note that we want a situation where both point a so when we are starting point a and point b both are touching the road so after few rotations again it will happen that both of them are touching the road so which is the first situation as uh, so is it that after the first rotation itself you will hit this situation or <clears throat> will it be 4,7 as padmini ji said uh shruti ji is saying 196 rotations so shruti ji 196 rotations of both the wheels or is it just the front wheel and harshit ji uh, you you are attempting to say what should be the process can you can you tell the answer harshit ji and maybe what the process you are saying is right but maybe uh, it's irrelevant Keshav is saying one comma two, seven comma four. Both the wheels after one ninety six rotations. Okay, so Shruti ji is saying uh, it will not happen after the first rotation, but after one ninety six rotations. And will we have to wait for one ninety six rotations, Shruti ji, or it can happen before that as well? Okay, let's. let's look at the answer right um, some of you are saying 4,7 some are saying 7,4 need to take lcm the diameter is different okay yeah so let's understand this right so <clears throat> one is 49 inches so for the rear wheel to complete one full circle on the road it will have to travel 2 pi multiplied by 49 by 2 that much distance those many inches it, the tractor has to travel only then it will complete the rear wheel will complete one rotation and only after 2 into pi into 49 by 2 only after the tractor has moved that much distance will the point b touch the road again whereas the front wheel after it has moved 2 into pi into 28 by 2 after the tractor has moved that much distance which is less than 2 pi 49 by 2 there itself so a would have already touched the road before b comes back and hence uh, as one of you said it's 1 comma 1 that's definitely not the answer now when is the first situation so of course after 196 rotations uh, it would happen but can it happen sooner so indeed the the answer is that after the rear wheel has completed four rotations and even if you don't 
multiply by 2 pi because it will get cancelled if you just multiply 4 by 49 and you multiply and you divide the result by 28 you will get the answer so front wheel has to rotate seven times and rear wheel has to rotate four times after that you'll again have the situation where a and b both are touching the road so indeed 4 comma 7 is the correct answer and as harshit ji was saying we have to take the lcm of the two which uh, many of you got as well so let me now launch the next question on the poll window <coughs> let me take you through the question consider a situation that the travel the tractor moves for one kilometer and then after one kilometer which out of the two points between a and b which one would have touched the road more number of times When you are answering the second question about wear and tear, assume that the quality of rubber, the thickness of the tires, they are same, unlike how we see in real life. Okay, so I have uh, around 30% of you. Uh, who have responded will wait for just a little longer and then see the results as well as the right answer here we do have one right answer okay so uh, which out of the two points would be touching the road more number of times if the tractor has traveled the same distance the correct answer is point a because as we just, when we were going through the example, we talked about it, that the rear wheel has to travel two into pi into 49 divided by two. It has to travel that much distance, the entire circumference. Whereas front wheel, so by that time, the front wheel has already done more than one rotations, which is uh, the reason A would be touching the road more number of times. And based on that, we can also infer who will undergo more wear and tear, the wheel which is coming in contact with the road more often because the wear and tear happens mainly because of the rubbing the friction between the surface of the wheel and the surface of the tire and the surface of road so the front wheel will undergo more wear and tear compared to rear wheel <clears throat> and uh, in fact when we are talking about wear and tear uh, if, if you just extend that concept to Forget the tractor tires. Uh, consider a situation where uh, just a regular uh, four wheeler, if you are over inflating the tires, then you'll have a situation like this where the tire is touching the road. So, the center part of the tire where you have the uh, main grooves, they'll be touching the road more than the sides. Whereas, if you, if you keep it under inflated, then the sides will be touching more whereas at the center it won't be touching as much and because of that there will be a difference in the wear and tear that you'll see so some tires you would see uh, something like this and in that case that person who's maintaining the car uh, or whichever is the vehicle has a habit of keeping it under inflated whereas if you see this kind of uh, uh, position uh, this kind of shape of the tire then it means it's more over inflated more often than under inflated if it is proper then all the surfaces will be touching as frequently and uh, we will come back to each of these okay in each of these what are the competencies that we are exercising and uh, why do we have these extensions so we started with a story in each case and we are building few questions on top of them so here is another uh, situation the concept of boiling a liquid and i'm giving this information first when we heat a liquid the 
energy gets passed on to the particles of the liquid and it reaches a point the average energy which of the liquid which is the temperature it reaches a point beyond which the molecules they start escaping the liquid and that's when we say that it's getting converted to the gaseous state it's getting vaporized what's interesting is when it reaches this state if i supply additional heat all that is taken away by some molecules to escape and hence the additional energy is not getting reflected in the average energy of the liquid which means the temperature remains constant after it reaches the boiling point till what point it remains constant till the, all the liquid gets converted to vapor having this information let us now look at a situation so the situation is that we have a mixture so we don't have a single liquid we have two liquids acetone and water what is also given to you is the boiling point of both the liquids it's given that acetone boils at 56 degrees and water at 100 and now we have four graphs where we are plotting the time and the temperature so which out of these four graphs correctly represents the change in the temperature of the mixture please respond on the poll window So I have twenty <clears throat> percent votes. <clears throat> we'll wait for another five seconds and then see the results. Okay. So. Uh, there's none of the options which has not got a vote so eight people have voted for a five have voted for d and 18 each for b and c so let us understand so if you uh, go back to the information which was given to us before the situation is that the temperature remains constant for some time so, and obviously the it will not get vaporized immediately after it reaches the boiling point gradually the vaporization keeps happening and the first liquid to vaporize will be acetone which will be at 56 degrees so somewhere over here and at that point some time has to elapse with a flat curve so this correctly represents the boiling of acetone but once it reaches 100 degrees it continues to rise which is incorrect you should have a flat curve there as well so the correct answer is c and if you <coughs> let, let's if you uh, extend this to a different situation so this um, technology which is called the fractional distillation which is used for separating two liquids which have uh, two different boiling points uh, and it's used most often for separating crude oil into its uh, constituents let's say petrol diesel or paraffin wax or <clears throat> many other ingredients which come out what's the process which is used so you have this column which has multiple chambers and the temperature of these chambers is different so if you as the color also uh, indicates the temperature of the chamber at the bottom is much higher compared to temperature of the chamber at the top so the temperature keeps reducing as you go up along the fractional distillation column so how does it work so you pour hot crude oil in the bottom most chamber and the liquid vaporizes if it reaches a chamber which has a temperature below the boiling point of that liquid then its state will get converted to liquid and hence it can be taken out from this chamber and others which uh, continue to vaporize they go up and once they reach 
the chamber which has a temperature lower than its boiling point, then they condense. That's how they get separated. <clears throat> so here we are given the boiling points of four liquids which come out from uh, crude oil. And you are supposed to arrange them from top to bottom. So if it was only these four liquids which we extract, then what will we get in the topmost chamber? What will we get in the second topmost, third topmost, and what will we get in the bottommost chamber? Let me see if I have a poll question for this. Uh, no, we will, we will not go with poll. You can respond on the chat window. And what you can respond on chat is, what will you get in this second chamber, second chamber from the top? You can just answer that. Okay, some of you are saying kerosene. <laughs> what was the CBDA? <laughs> okay, that's the order I think you are saying, Rituji. That's interesting. CBDA. Uh, I guess you are saying paraffin wax first, then diesel, then kerosene, and then petrol. Okay, you are going. Yes, diesel, kerosene, petrol. Yes, so the second chamber, we will get kerosene. So petrol, which has a very low boiling point, it will continue to vaporize through all the chambers. And only the topmost chamber, so imagine the bottommost chamber has a temperature of uh, 350 degrees Celsius, then paraffin wax will get condensed there. You go further up, then assume it is 250 degrees, then diesel will get condensed there. Above that is 150, then kerosene will get condensed there and petrol will further go up. <clears throat> now a slightly different competency the, we continue to extend the distillation process. So this time we have three liquids and the boiling points of all the three liquids are given. And uh, <clears throat> what we are saying is, uh, just one second. What we are saying is uh, here the flask in which all the three liquids are being heated, we are naming it as distilling flask. It gets condensed in another flask, we are calling that the receiving flask. The question is, if there was a thermometer which you could read here, it shows that the temperature has reached 57 degrees. So it was, it reached 56 degrees and as expected, it will stay at 56 degrees for some time. Then it goes to 57 degrees. When it reaches to that point, what should we do? And this again, uh, I want you to respond on poll. And the four options are <clears throat> the water circulated through the condenser pipe, that should be made cooler. Receiving flask should be replaced. C is nothing should be done because it's anyways going well. D is distilling flask should be replaced. Okay, let us look at the results. So 38% have said water circulated around the condenser pipe should be made cooler. And maybe this is slightly ambiguous because even in the session yesterday, many people voted for this and I can see where you are coming from. That if the temperature has increased to condense it, you'll have to circulate a cooler liquid. So maybe not necessarily incorrect uh, option, but if you pay attention, what will happen is when it reaches 56 degrees, it's the first liquid which will start condensing. 
as soon as it reaches 57 degrees the next liquid in the line which is going to boil at 78 degrees that will start vaporizing very soon and before that happens you must replace the receiving flask otherwise you will again get a mixture of two liquids and hence the correct answer is receiving flask should be replaced and this particular question falls in one particular category it, it is testing one specific type of competency which we will be discussing very soon <clears throat> and since we are talking about types of competencies um, let's look at the uh, competencies which are published by uh, different organizations based on research the first list we are showing you is the list of competencies which ncert has published most of you would have seen this in the teacher handbook uh, the science uh, handbook so we have compiled this information for grade 6 to 10 and uh, if you notice the learning outcomes in these handbooks they are in have the competency the skill which is required followed by one example which is related to some topic in that specific grade but quite often so we noticed that many competencies they are getting repeated <clears throat> just that the examples the topics vary for example the ability to identify based on the property uh, the children are expected to exhibit that that is one of the outcomes we are expecting from grade 6 as well as grade 7 children what is different in the two learning outcomes for grade 6 and 7 is only the examples so based on uh, this simple uh, <clears throat> method of grouping we have grouped the learning outcomes given by uh, ncert and we have got a list of uh, 18 competencies and each competency so depending on which grade it is we notice that there are different levels so it's uh, one or two keywords one or two uh, items which get added uh, in the subsequent years what you see under the level column is verbatim taken from the handbook published by ncert so for example uh, if we look at the this competency the ability to construct models so for grade 6 7 and 8 uh, we are not expecting them to uh, design using eco friendly resources that's something which is added uh, only in grade 9 and 10 similarly if we look at uh, the ability to classify or differentiate 6 7 and 8 we do not have phenomena but in grade 9 and 10 we expect the children to be able to classify to differentiate phenomena as well other than material and organisms and processes <clears throat> so let us take uh, a couple of examples out of the questions that we just asked and try to see try to map them to uh, some of these competencies so that we can uh, gain a better understanding so let us look at the first question which was about uh, identifying uh, which uh, diagram which diagram correctly represents the flowers of papaya and brinjal what do you think which competency is this question testing and you can type in the chat window uh, of course i have removed the table but uh, in case it has registered in your mind and if required i can also display it back so we are talking about the ability to identify based on properties ability to differentiate and then also classify there's one entire range of competencies related to conducting experiments constructing models and making measurements calculations and inferences and there's another category which is related to explaining to communicating communicate back through graphs through uh, diagrams and there's another category where 
which is related to application for solving actual problems and uh, being sensitive to the environment to the and to the society okay let me see the chat window identify and differentiate many of you are saying identify and differentiate lavanya ma'am is also saying applies competency one two and three sujata ji is saying one two and three yes okay let us see so thanks thanks so much for the quick response uh, let us uh, look at it so yes uh, first for me to be able to answer this question the first step i have to be uh, i have to do is identify male and female parts of a flower by looking at the shape so uh, it's likely that some of us got the answer incorrect because we couldn't make out that if this is the shape this means it's a male flower plant so uh, i should be able to recall the shape and based on that identify which one is a male reproductive part and which one is female reproductive reproductive part then i should be based on this i should be able to differentiate between unisexual and bisexual flowers but i cannot do that if i can't even identify the male and female reproductive parts and hence both of these two competencies are getting exercised here and once i have done that i also exercise the ability to be able to so uh, trust me this is a completely different competency there are some people who uh, may not be able to read long text but you give figures you show them pictures they get it very quickly but there are some people who struggle with that so if you visit public places you typically have some uh, drawings and you also have textual instruction and if you just do a very informal survey within your family you will find that some people prefer to read line by line the textual instruction which is given as some people prefer looking at the drawing <clears throat> so that's another ability that i should be able to after having done all this i should be able to say that it is exactly the figure c which represents the brinjal flower now the let's look at the second example about the graphs so what do you think which ability is getting exercised here and uh, and of course this mapping unlike the some of the previous actual science and maths questions you may not have one correct answer as some of you said it's also about applying it so you should be able to recall and apply your understanding and concept about uh, male and female flowers interpreting graphs that's right and application and identify as well okay so that's interesting uh, i see that some of you also feel that even here it is about identifying what i thought was this is about applying so i have to apply first i am given the information in the story in the case itself that once a liquid reaches its boiling point so i don't need to recall or remember it it's given to me but then i should be able to apply it back that if it reaches a boiling point after that the temperature will remain constant and in this case since i have two liquids with two different boiling points the temperature will remain constant two times during the entire distillation process so i should be able to apply that and very clearly conclude that in my head and after i have done that i should be able to identify the appropriate graph so then <clears throat> i am also exercising my ability to interpret graphs as uh, one of you said <clears throat> so these are uh, just simple examples uh, and uh, we I'm, i'm showing the mapping uh, of course we have uh, we already have close to 100 questions per grade and per subject and we have mapped them to different competencies not that any of these competencies are uh, a complete set it's likely that uh, we may have missed out certain uh, competencies which is the reason uh if i look at competencies as a curriculum then we need to refer to other literature as well so we also looked at the uh, list of competencies published by this organization called pisa which conducts uh, international assessment tests in fact it stands for program for international student assessment india had participated in this exam only in 2008 after that we have been staying away from it this year we were supposed to participate but we have again postponed it <clears throat> p 
PISA conducts these mathematical literacy, scientific literacy, and reading literacy tests for all the 15-year-old children of different countries. And based on that, it gives a feedback to the government about the changes that they should be bringing into their education system. India, in 2008, when we participated, we had nominated two states, Tamil Nadu and Himachal Pradesh. Out of the 65 participants, Himachal Pradesh came 63rd and Tamil Nadu was 64th. And only one country, I think Kazakhstan or some other country, it was after Tamil Nadu. <clears throat> the, the difficulty, of course, is not uh, in applying procedures. Most of our students, we have seen in so many other surveys as well. There was one quality education survey conducted by educational initiatives and Wipro, which also showed very clearly that our students are very good at procedures, but uh, we find it hard to apply things back when we tweak a little. So PISA has given the scientific literacy competencies in three main categories. Uh, one is this whole thing about explaining and hypothesis and making predictions. There's another category, which is about interpreting given data. And uh, the third category is about evaluating or designing a scientific inquiry. What we realized as we kept designing questions and started mapping is that uh, this third category, it's uh, very uh, difficult to test it unless you have an actual inquiry being done. As the students have to go through the experience of doing an inquiry and when some activity has to happen. And activity need not be just experiential learning. It need not be an experiment. It could be say, some literature is given to them and they are supposed to study, research, discuss within the group and come back. Uh, for example, uh, it's so common these days for various uh, kinds of WhatsApp messages. Uh, they, they try to communicate various beliefs. There was one message which was going around during the start of the pandemic that if you eat alkaline food, uh, then coronavirus dies because uh, that kind of pH environment is not conducive for Corona. And uh, it also gave the list of food items which are alkaline in nature, which included things like banana and of course, bitter gourd, etc. Let's say something as simple as that, that this WhatsApp message is given and we ask them to conduct an inquiry based on uh, the research done from cutouts from different magazines or research papers. And they study that, discuss within the group and share their uh, inferences, their beliefs. <clears throat> but what is necessary is to have some kind of activity. And uh, since we are talking about that, let's take one example where we have a very simple activity. This happens to be a hands-on experiment. Uh, what's being done is we inflate a balloon, tie a tight knot so that the air does not escape. Then we tie a cotton thread at the end of the balloon so that we can suspend some kind of weight. Now, in this case, we have selected a ring magnet, but it can be anything. It can also be a stone or anything else that you are able to tightly uh, suspend below the balloon. After doing that, we place this entire assembly in a bottle. Uh, it's an empty bottle uh, initially. After that, we pour water in it. And as you can see, uh, in fact, Later, somebody has added additional magnets here, ring magnets. And in spite of that, uh, thanks to the air in the balloon, the entire assembly is floating. What's interesting is once you press the bottle from outside, so note that the press the bottle from outside, then the balloon and magnet assembly comes down. And once you release it, it goes back up. Okay, so the just a series of pictures and uh, a commentary by me that explains how this procedure, how this uh, experiment is happening. Uh, the question I have for you, um, you can type in the chat window is, uh, let's say you are given the information that floating and sinking depends only on two parameters. One is the density of the object itself and other is the density of the fluid. And note that I'm saying fluid very consciously we have water in this case, it could have been a gas as well. So any fluid, so if the density of the object being placed in the fluid is less than the density of the fluid, then it will stay, then it will float. If it is more, then it will sink. 
<clears throat> in this case, why does pressing the bottle make the balloon and magnet assembly sink? What do you think happens? It's interesting, Krishna ma'am has, and even Seema ma'am has talked about comparison in the, I think it was in response to the previous question, what are the competencies? Yes, pressure, uh, yes, Nisha ma'am, it is pressure, but what happens because of the pressure? Do you think any parameter changes? And if yes, which parameter will change? Density will be reduced. Ravinder ma'am is saying density and uh, the density of the balloon and magnet or the water. And will it reduce, will it increase? More pressure, less volume, more density. Vidya Sagarji is saying more pressure, then the volume will reduce. Uh, Vidya Sagarji, can you also uh, say specifically whose volume will reduce? Is it the water's volume? Is it the balloon's volume? Pressure reducing, yes. So see, what is, what is very clear is it's the pressure from outside which is causing this. But what, what changes? So yes, Jyoti ji is saying density will increase. And uh, I suppose all of you, Vidya Sagar ji, Jyoti ji, you all are referring to uh, the density of the balloon and magnet that, that will increase. Uh, <clears throat> and if you just look at the information which is given in the question, the fact that it was floating in the beginning tells us that the <clears throat> density of the balloon and magnet was less than the density of water. <clears throat> and later, since it is sinking, it means the, the pressing has led to the increase in the density of the balloon and magnet, and that's the only reason it can sink. <clears throat> so it is clear that the density has increased. Now my question is, whose density has increased, and how has it increased? Has the mass of the balloon increased, or has the volume reduced, or has the volume increased? And as some of you have already said that the volume of air, yes, uh, Binduji is also saying that density will increase because the volume will reduce. The air inside the balloon, that gets compressed. So the density of the system will increase, with Sagarji is saying. So uh, the balloon, cotton thread, and magnet, we are talking about the density of these three together. And that system, the density increases. Why does it increase? Because the volume reduces because the balloon is filled with something which is compressible. And that could be one very simple variable that you can try and change. So it's a very simple experiment. I would request you to just go back and try it out. It's sort of fun to play with it. It's also documented and kept on the ThinkTech website. If I place, if I fill the balloon with something else which is not compressible instead of air, let's say I fill it with liquid. If I fill it with cooking oil, so cooking oil uh, in water, since the oil's density is less than water, it will stay suspended. But if the entire balloon with, with no air bubbles inside, if the entire balloon is filled with cooking oil and I repeat the same experiment, will I be able to make the balloon come down? <clears throat> we see exact reverse when we uh, deep fry a puri. So if you pay attention, when you place a puri in the frying pan, oil is hot, but the density of the dough, it is more than the density of the oil. And hence, initially, it will go and sink. Why does it float after that? If the density of the dough, I'm giving you the information that the density of dough is more than the density of oil, why do you think it starts floating after some time? Volume will increase, that's right. Because it gets filled with air, so doesn't it already have some air in it? So where did that air come from? So did the cooking oil provide that air? Air enters the puri. Uh, Krishna ji is saying that water of dough converted in vapor. 
Nice. That's interesting with the Sagarji. And in fact, hot puri, if you press it and break it, you will see some uh, vapors coming out. So it's uh, the water which gets converted to vapor. Also, the dough has some space in between. In fact, uh, quite often people judge the quality of puri based on did it um, did you, uh, did you have the two layers getting separated completely or not? It depends quite a lot on the way the dough has been made and the way you do the rolling. So if you have good gap, if there is some air between the layers, then that air also expands. And because of that, and it expands because the temperature of the oil is high. So if you place the puri in cold oil, then it will stay there. It will not expand. So exact reverse is happening in the case of puri. Initially, the density is higher than the fluid. As it gets heated, the, dense, the volume increases and hence the density decreases. And because of that, it starts floating later. <clears throat> now, let me extend the same story. And uh, for this, I'll ask the question on the pole window. So two students have worked on the same experiment, but uh, Farida had put more air in the balloon compared to Joseph. Then if you compare the effort required by Farida to bring the assembly down, will that effort be more than Joseph or less, or will it be same? Okay, unlike the previous questions, this one I'll, I would like to end sooner. Um, majority is right, so you'll require more pressure and uh, more effort. And the reason is simple that it's even lower. So you have to cross that level. So initially the density is lower than the density of the fluid. And by pressing, you are increasing its density and increasing it beyond the density of the fluid. But if to begin with the density is even lower, then I'll require more effort. I'll have to reduce the volume even further to increase its density sufficiently. So the effort required will be more. And now let me ask a question which covers the third category of PISA competency, which is about evaluating and um, designing a scientific inquiry. This is also the competency which was getting tested in the distillation question where the question was, what would you do after the temperature crosses 56 degrees? That you have to replace the receiving flask. Same competency, but a different situation and different question. So two different experiments done on this. In one case, the bottle is placed in hot water for some time and then you repeat the experiment. Another case, you dissolve some salt in the water and some numbers are given here only to communicate that sufficient salt has been dissolved to make it almost saturated because at room temperature, you cannot dissolve more than 36 grams of salt in 100 ml. Here it is 250 ml bottle. So assume that you cannot dissolve more than 90 grams. That's typically the maximum limit. So that much salt is dissolved in both the cases what was observed is we are not asking what will be the change. What was observed is that there was a change. There was a visible effect in the effort required in terms of the results of the experiment. What is common between these two experiments? And this I want you to respond on the chat window. Yes, change in pressure inside the bottle. So, okay, uh, I think uh, what you are saying, Sirisha ji, is uh, <clears throat> since in one case you'll have warm water inside, the pressure of the water inside will be more. Increasing density of water. DPG is saying 
uh, and I suppose, uh, Deepthi ji, you are referring to the case where we are adding salt to water. In that case, we are increasing density of water. What will happen when we place the bottle in hot water? What will happen to the density of water inside as the heat gets transferred to the water? Will the density of water change in any way? Yeah, Animesh is saying density of water will decrease in that case. So then what is common between the two? Density decreases when it is hot. That's right. So what, um, let's come back to the original question. What is common between the two experiments? Yes. So. And, and the reason this experiment could be relevant and important for what we are doing is uh, in the first case, by pressing the bottle, we are changing the density of the balloon and magnet assembly. Now we are changing another variable that what happens if I keep the density of the assembly same, but I change the density of the medium of the fluid. And changing is both ways. If I increase the density, then I should require, the prediction would be that I would require more effort to bring the balloon magnet assembly down. And in fact, maybe it's harder to bring it down, uh, which is why people say that if you want to learn swimming, go to sea, don't be afraid because ocean water being salty is so hard to drown there. There are other kinds of accidents can happen that uh, the water can take you back, but otherwise it's very difficult, very uh, difficult to go to the bottom. Similarly, hot water, the density is reduced. So in both cases, we want to find out the effect of changing the density of the fluid on the effort required to bring the balloon and magnet assembly down. So that is the third category of competency. Uh, just be patient and stay with me for some more time. I know it is uh, one hour, 20 minutes already. We'll cover um, <clears throat> one uh, little information about mathematical literacy and then Come back to how exactly we can work together on competency development for your students. For mathematical literacy, unlike scientific literacy, we couldn't find a very clear list of competencies. Of course, the learning outcomes from NCRT, they are compiled uh, together. The PISA handbook talked about a process instead of very clear list of competencies, where the process goes something like this, that you start with a real world problem and you formulate and shift to the mathematical world. In the case of tractor wheels, the real world problem, let's say the question could have been that since the sizes are different, the size of the two wheels, will there be a difference in the way they are moving? Should they be designed differently? Should the thickness of the rubbers be different? Should, would the maintenance required be different for the two? Because if um, otherwise removing the back wheel may be very difficult, should I make it easier to remove the front wheel? So let's say it's some of those design questions. So we have formulated it to this question that after how many rotations will point A and point B touch the ground uh, road together? And we have realized that it's only about finding LCM. So now employ is the stage, is the action where you'll actually use the knowledge of mathematics, you'll apply the equations and formula and arrive at the solution that after four rotations of the back wheel and seven of the front wheel, they both will touch together. So what do you interpret based on that? You'll interpret that after one kilometer, the rear wheel would have touched the road less often compared to front wheel. And where it gets uh, valuable is you evaluate those results and map it back to the real world problem that, oh, this means the front wheel will undergo more wear and tear. Should I be mindful about it while designing the tires and accordingly uh, decide, let's say the rubber thickness or the ease with which the wheels can be removed. So this is where the real world is and this is the mathematical world. What we have noticed is uh, the part which we were just talking about, the part of uh, the competencies, which is about using the procedure, applying formula, that is when you are exercising this competency. And our students, they are made to practice this very often. If you look at even IITs, etc., problem solving, and we 
practice so much that unless somebody else has practiced as much as me that person will not be able to match the pace that i have and hence practice has suddenly become a very important uh, uh, competency that if you are able to get gain speed then you are better than others but we are missing out on so many other competencies say you ask somebody to go and find out how many sheets of uh, plastic or let supply wood you will need to cover certain area they are able to first there could be a struggle in formulating and figuring out which formula to use but let's say you do that i've seen that they would say that oh, i require 436.7 cm square of plywood so if you actually go and buy and tell the shopkeeper the shopkeeper will say hey i don't understand this you i have 7 by 3 i have 8 by 4 and i have 6 by 4 plywood sheets or plastic sheets you tell me how many sheets you want and so it's equally important to once you go to the uh, once you have the mathematical solution you have to take it back to the real world so here is one last question that we will go through one last situation in maths so that we can appreciate the four stages of the mathematical process and this is the famous tortoise and rabbit story that most of us have grown up with uh, there's a small change i'll take you through the story uh, the change is that uh, say the uh, both of them they are running a race for 500 meters but because last time the race happened rabbit won by a large margin in terms of time so this time tortoise was given a concession so tortoise will start 200 meter closer to the destination compared to rabbit we have been given the speed at which tortoise is moving and as we have always been hearing tortoise is moving with a constant speed of 15 meters per minute rabbit what it does is uh, for the first 300 meters uh, it covers in half minute so that is the speed at which it runs after that sleeps for 30 minutes after waking up it will again run at the speed of 300 meters per half minute okay so the situation i hope you have got those numbers because this i'll not be able to display 500 meters is the total distance tortoise starts 200 meters away from the common starting point tortoise moves at a pace of 15 meters per minute and rabbit moves at a speed of 600 meters per minute for the first 30 minutes sleeps for some time and then after waking up again the same speed the question i have for you is let's say i plot the distance on y axis and time on x axis then which of these equations correctly represents the distance traveled by the tortoise and you can respond to this on the poll window this is the last question after that we'll try to sum up and summarize the session <laughs> savita ji uh, that's so comforting thanks for saying that savita ji saying don't don't feel about the time it's going well prob that's that's good okay so i have uh, around 20% votes is will wait for a few seconds which gives me time to drink some water okay let us look at the results <clears throat> so four out of the 38 people who voted have said y equal to 15x So yes, tortoise is moving at a constant speed of 15 meters per minute, and any time on the x-axis, x represents the number of minutes. So y equal to 15x should represent the distance. But let's remember that tortoise, and we are talking about the distance from the 
common starting point. I hope it says, yeah, if you can see here, consider a graph with distance covered from the common starting point. And hence, you have to add those 200 meters. So the correct answer is, as majority of you have said, 20 out of 38 people have said y equal to 15x plus 200. That indeed is the correct answer. <clears throat> what we have seen, as I, I, was, I was saying earlier, uh, quite often people are able to arrive at the final answer in terms of the number. But if I have to arrive at uh, the right formula, the stage uh, which the, the action which takes me from the real world problem to the mathematical world, that's where there is a struggle. Further, let's say I've got the uh, mathematical problem, I've formulated it, so now I'll apply and uh, I'll employ and get the results. Based on that, I'll figure out after how much time the tortoise reaches the destination and after how much time the rabbit reaches the destination because I'll need a similar equation for the distance traveled by the rabbit. Based on that, when I do the interpretation of the mathematical solution, that's when I'll have answers to questions like, okay, finally, who won the race? Which is okay. So uh, let's say we figure out that, okay, tortoise won the race. Uh, the real value comes when you apply it further, you evaluate those results. And let's say in this case, the evaluation could be in terms of these kind of questions that say we have seen it very often, the animals get together and they have a meeting that oh, this rabbit has a habit of sleeping all the time. And uh, let's give some concession to rabbit instead, or we reduce the concession given to tortoise. So how do you arrive at that? And uh, uh, please remember that even to arrive at some of these uh, the answers to questions like this, I'll have to probably collect more data and do some more calculations. In the case of the tractor problem, it was the question about which wheels will undergo more wear and tear. That is showing the evaluate stage. So now that we have talked about, uh, like we have looked at some of the examples and uh, I'm assuming that you also uh, look at the uh, goal, the objective of testing and hence developing competencies in our students as important as us. In that case, how do you actually implement it? What are the options which are available? And trust me right now, in terms of the actual examination and in, at the system level, we are seeing competency questions being asked only in terms of case study questions, only in grade 10 and grade 12. But that's going to change. Many of you would have seen the circular on SUFL tests, which are going to be conducted for grade three, five, and eight. And of course, the SUFL test is not going to decide the, it's not going to provide the promotion criteria. But based on the SUFL score of the school, uh, we are going to get an idea about the focus a particular school has on competencies. And hence, competency assessment is going to get more and more common in the coming days. So how do we prepare ourselves for that? What are the options which ThinkTech has to offer to you? So we do have these printed workbooks. So we already have uh, the printed workbooks for uh, grade nine and 10 for maths and science. Uh, <clears throat> each of these workbooks, we have around uh, 10 themes. Each theme has two to three case studies. So a total of, uh, 25, 30 case studies covering close to 100 questions. And uh, of course, these uh, printed books, they are available for 10th and 9th, for grade eight to five, we are working on it. And say you are interested in having uh, these printed books for the grade nine and 10 students for the next year, what do we do for this year? That was exactly our idea behind making the online quizzes available to the students for practice during the next one month. And of course, that would be free of cost. <clears throat> if you are interested in forwarding the links to these online quizzes to your students, there's a short video that we have uh, prepared. Uh, I'll, I'll be talking about it. I'll paste the link to that very soon. 
uh, <clears throat> let me just cover the last point, which was which is about the experiential learning program. As we discussed, especially for science, it was very clear to us that there's one entire category of competency which doesn't get covered if we don't link experience to the competencies. And hence, uh, we also have the experiential program, which standalone it is available for grade to grade nine and 10 only as of now, but it will be done soon for grade five to eight as well. If you want to purchase the printed workbooks, how do you do that? Uh, the MRP is 450 for this particular group and by, by uh, concession for this group, if you notice, we are interacting with you through a particular channel. So we met through the alternate labs. We gave an option to some teachers to become a part of a group through which we can stay connected. And out of that group, it's only a smaller subset of teachers who have shown interest in attending this workshop. <clears throat> so it's uh, what we are expecting to come out of this entire exercise through these multiple workshops that we have with you is to build a community of teachers who are passionate about making changes, about making contributions to the changes in the education system. So 350 rupees is for this group. If you buy 100 or more books, which means you are probably buying it for the entire school. In that case, it's further uh, lower. If you are interested, there's an optional question that has to be answered in the feedback form. Feedback form otherwise is very simple. Your name and school name has to be entered so that we can include that in the e-certificate that we will issue after the training. If you want to uh, use the online quizzes, which I was just talking about, then the process involves just three, three steps. Register your school on the digital platform. You generate a link. Now this link has to be generated separately for each school because then the school ID becomes a part of the link and your students don't have to go and search for the school's affiliation number, et cetera. And that's why this is an important step. After that, you share the one link with your students on WhatsApp or email or whatever is your preferred medium. And obviously the children who are interested in participating in those quizzes, they'll uh, take part. Uh, <clears throat> the registration and generation of link this has been captured in a short video of three and a half minutes, which Rajesh is going to share on the chat window. And we will also be sharing on the WhatsApp groups with you in case uh, you want to uh, use this option. The online quizzes, they are limited by time. So as soon as your students log in and start answering, the time and the clock will start ticking and there's a one hour time limit for each uh, quiz which has 10 to 15 questions immediately after they submit they'll be able to see the correct answer which we thought was necessary for them to be able to evaluate themselves and quite a bit of learning will happen as they see the correct answer final objective if some schools are interested in also looking at the performance report of their schools we will be happy to share it uh, at the end of this program sometime in march Okay, so with that, we have come to an end to what we wanted to share. Uh, we can take questions, uh, if any, and now we'll also be able to unmute uh, you all selectively. So please raise hands or type in the chat window if you want to ask something uh, by coming on the mic. So the feedback form as well as the YouTube video, the three and a half minute video for registering your school that both have been pasted in the chat window. I was responding to the uh, question on one, let me repeat that certificate you'll get in 48 hours and you'll receive it as email. Regarding books, depending on the number of teachers who have shown interest, uh, we'll either share it on the same WhatsApp group or we will contact you separately with the, uh, and we'll share the purchase link with you. 
of course if you are looking for a school level program uh, in that case we will uh, have one of my colleagues will uh, get in touch with your school coordinator and uh, we can take it forward what we uh, intend to do is uh, have these kind of sessions on a regular basis we'll probably not have a very high frequency but maybe once in uh, three to four weeks uh, for the teachers where we would also have uh, we would invite uh, speakers from outside who can uh, add value to this community so if you do have uh, specific suggestions on uh, what kind of topics you would want us to cover then uh, please write it to me separately uh, through whatsapp my number is there in the, as the, one of the admins in the all the whatsapp groups yes uh, as i just said uh, certificates you will be getting uh, based on the attendance that we get through the feedback forms and you will be receiving it as an email uh, within 48 hours 9th to 12th uh, as of now we have only up to grade 10 grade 11 and 12 we haven't started making the books yet grade 9 and 10 we will be happy to uh, share the link with you uh, from where you can purchase it if it's a single copy if it's a larger number then we will email it to you And anyways, the online version of these uh, quizzes for your students to practice, one subset will be uh, provided through these uh, online quizzes, as I said, and we will be sharing the links to that on the WhatsApp group. For nine and 10, one copy each. So Nutanji, it would be best if you, uh, in case you have not done it, uh, it would be good if you can indicate that in the feedback form. That will help us track and uh, will also help us with the planning since we'll get an idea about the total number of uh, books that we are, we need to publish for your personal use uh, yes ma'am so for anyone uh, for grade 5 to 10 is what we are targeting to complete by this uh, june In grade 3 and 4 we are still not uh, very sure the cost, as I said, ma'am, uh, for this group, any teacher, it will be 350 rupees. But if it is at a school level, because the quantity would be larger, uh, the total number of books you are buying is 100 or more, then the cost will be 300 rupees per book. Uh, Neil is saying date is incorrect. Uh, not sure I got that. Date is incorrect in the form. Uh, Vishal, it was uh, flagged by two, three of them uh -huh. saying that they already got the certificate, but in the certificate, the date is uh, what they're mentioning, March 10. Oh, because Raghu would have set up the automated process. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, okay, okay. I, I, I get this. I think uh, it has been.